Welcome back to Terpy Eyes. I'm Ryan. It's been a bit since part 3 of Building a Grow Room was posted. I've got a lot planned behind the scenes for the channel during this time. I'm very excited to show you very soon. We're going to get the channel focused on grow tent content again along with regular uploads every week. It's still a bit before we can get to that point as we're waiting on plants to grow at this point. If you want more up-to-date content, be sure to follow me on Instagram, at TerpyHive. In part three, we covered getting the cuttings rooted into clones using an aeroponics cloner from Easy Cloner. Since then, I've had two pump failures on the units on me during a six month span. In a future video, I'll show how I adapted a different, more reliable pump to the Easy Cloner. So hopefully we won't have pump failures anymore. After getting the clones transplanted into one gallon cocoa bags, we had to top the two editor tables to try and slow down the growth to allow for the middle table to catch up since they were much smaller and planted about a week later. During that time, we also swapped out the manifold bubbler head watering system for a micro drip irrigation system, which proves to be an outstanding choice as it fixed the issue of us having an uneven watering across the entire room of plants. I just want you all to know that please be aware of the scammers in the comments section. I will never ask you to send me a message on WhatsApp about sales or giveaways. They're using my display picture. You should be able to tell by the username that is not terpiized. So please report those comments as it is very difficult for me to keep up with the amount of comments they leave on this page. After getting the bubbler manifold system out of the way, we could install the drip emitters. Each emitter is pressure based, so they need a maximum of 15 psi before they start watering each plant. This feature is what the other system is missing, as the entire system needs to reach 15 psi before the plants start to receive water, whereas the manifold setup would just water each plant as the water reached that area, which resulted in a small difference across the entire room, which multiplied after each watering cycle. The plants have really exploded with growth during the first 20 days of flower, which is known as the stretch phase or transition into flower. We should have really cleaned up the undersides of the plants before putting them into flower as they were over vegged at that point. So now you can see just how dense the lower growth has become. This limits light penetration to the important parts of the plant along with blocking most of the airflow needed to those important areas. The Grower's Choice ROI E720 LED lights and the Mars Hydro FC6500 lights have both done a great job at covering the entire canopy with the proper amount of light. Under the ROI 720 lights, we have around 800 PPFD at this point. Whereas under the FC6500 light, we have about 100 PPFD less compared to the grower choice lights. Both lights are still providing above the minimum amount of PPFD for the plants at this point in the life cycle. Since we are not supplementing the room with CO2, any higher PPFD is just wasted energy as the plants can't absorb any more light due to lower CO2 levels in the room. I placed an order for predator mites with Copert as preventative measures for IPM. When ordering bugs, it takes about a week to receive the order. During that time, I did notice some thrip damage on the leaves on a few of the plants. So I knew I would have to place a second order that would be more suitable for acting fast to attack the thrips that were present in the garden.
it's time to clean up the lower sections of the plants. Personally, I like to do this process between day 18 and day 24 of flower, depending on the strain that's being grown. Usually at the end of the stretch phase, this process is also known as lollipopping. I start by removing all the lower sections of the plant first. As I work my way up the main stem, I keep an eye for any main thick branches that reach up to the canopy level and don't remove those. I also like to remove everything under the first layer of trellis netting. This keeps things very clean. If I notice any thin branches, I remove those also, as any thinner than normal branches won't have the strength to develop any sizable buds. By taking the time now to remove all the weak growth underneath, it will help come harvest time since it will allow the plant to focus all of its energy to the top areas of the plant that receive the most amount of light. By cleaning up the underside of the canopy, it drastically helps with airflow. With the increased airflow under the canopy, you have a much less of a chance of your bugs multiplying along with any type of disease growth. Let's take a quick look at how I have my drains for the table set up. Since I have two trays per table, I have a three quarter inch poly tube that connects the two trays together. As you can see, the tube is slightly wavy under the table, which needs to be fixed in the future. Then after the two trays connect, I have a poly tube teed off, which drains into a 30 gallon plastic tote. Each table has one of these plastic totes, The three 30 gallon plastic totes are also connected at the bottom of each tote, allowing all three totes to remain at the same level. This gives me the ability to drain all three totes from a single location. It also helps with evening out the levels in each of the totes in case one table's runoff is more than another. Since I need to drain these totes manually with a pump, it's a backup in case I'm not there soon enough in case one single tote might overflow. Well, I'm sure most of you are wondering what happened to the middle table of plants. I wasn't happy about the situation, but those clones came from an outside source and with my limited time during transplanting, along with trying to get them caught up to the outer tables, I overlooked them having spider mites, which ended up growing the population over time. The copert predatory mites that I put in the room are the packs, just weren't the correct product for the infestation as those are a preventative measure. As I waited the week for my second order to arrive, there were more predator mites that I wasn't happy with battling. So I made the tough decision to remove all the plants in that middle row. Thankfully, they didn't spread to the outer tables and whatever small amount did make it over would be treated by the loose predator mites that I received as those are fast acting once they are spread out into the room.
So far, the Dutch Pro Nutrients have been doing a fantastic job at providing all the nutrients the plants need. We have continued following the feeding chart at full strength and fed the plants with every watering at a pH of 6.3. Since swapping the irrigation system to the micro drip system, it's important to have very clean nutrients which the Dutch Pro Nutrients do a great job at. I haven't had any issues with clogged filters or drip emitters. Unfortunately, I was left hanging and unable to get my hands on any more Dutch Pro Nutrients to finish the growing cycle of these plants. Being in Canada, Dutch Pro Nutrients isn't available at any local stores, along with their inventory on Amazon was out of stock. After being told more was getting sent out to me, which never actually happened, I was left hanging and no choice but to switch nutrient lines in the middle of a flowering cycle. So I've reverted back to the Green Planet GP3 lineup that I've used in previous grows with good success. Thankfully, everything worked out in this grow cycle and we didn't have any issues arise by switching nutrients in the middle of the grow. We are now at week 6 of the grow and the thrip and spider mite issues have been resolved by the copart predatory mites. The plants are really packing on the size now along with becoming frosty and trichomes. The lights are all the way turned up at 100% and have an average of 8 to 900 ppfd across the entire canopy minus the very edges with an average distance of about 16 to 18 inches between the light and the canopy. You'll notice I swapped out the oversized 2x4 spider farmer tent that was being used for clones for a 4x4 tent from Mars Hydro along with adding a second easy cloner. This is just before I had the pump failure issues I talked about earlier in the video. I'll also be adding a grower's choice ROI E200 light to this tent which will allow for much bigger clones straight out of the cloner. There are a variety of different strains in here along with different ages. These clones are getting ready for the next round of plants into the room. We have more than we need which will allow us to pick the best ones to use. On the left we have Grape Stomper OG and then banana macaroon on the right of the left cloner. About halfway back we have the blue gas and behind that we have one butterfingers which is a cut from Justin Cron. We'll be running that in a grow series in a grow tent on the channel later on. <music> As for the cloner on the right, we have more blue gas, which takes up the entire back half of the cloner. Those have already been rooted for a bit. In front of the blue gas, we have two rows of ice cream cake, which I got from a friend. And lastly, at the front, we have three rows of apple cup, which came from a small pheno hunt I did offline. We have narrowed it down to three phenos so far of the apple cup, which will pick keeper out of the next run.
We have reached the end of week 7 now. The buds are continuing to put on weight. The Pulse Pro Grow Room Monitor has done a great job at providing me with all the necessary information about the environment over the entire grow cycle so far and has helped me with a couple failures. Highly recommend getting one of the Pulse Pros for any of your grow rooms or all of them. We ended up taking this cycle to 70 days, which is longer than we expected, but I think that was due to the heavy lollipopping job we did earlier in flower. When you strip a plant so heavily at one time, it typically adds about a week to the, your flowering stage. We continued feeding the plants with nutrients full strength until week 8, then half dose for week 9, and then we cut that again in half for week 10. But for the remaining 3 days before harvest, it was straight water pH to 6.3. This was a new way of flushing that I hadn't tried before, as I found it interesting from a few studies that had taken place. The typical 2-3 to three week flush is what most do, but new studies show that might actually damage the cell walls in a plant, so having a shorter flush time can actually benefit the plant overall come harvest time. You'll notice in the background that I also tried leaving the plants in place to dry. All I did was cut the main stalk at the base and remove all the cocoa bags and kept the room at 60% relative humidity and 60 degrees Fahrenheit with the lights off and all fans in the room remaining on. Now that all the buds are perfectly dried and ready to be trimmed, the first step is to buck the buds off the branches. Each table took me about four hours by myself. I think I could have sped the process up a bit for next time. After bucking the buds off the branches, we are left with just over two totes of untrimmed buds and a very big mess to clean up inside the room. The blue gas has a very good ratio of bud to leaf, which would make trimming the strain by hand very easy at a smaller scale, or if you had some help from other people to trim. Since all work is done in the room, I wanted to clean up the room a bit more before getting the trimming started. Since I kept the room at 60% relative humidity and 65 Fahrenheit, the buds could remain in the totes without any issues. So I spent a few hours fully cleaning the room, getting it ready for the reset and would be ready to trim the harvest, but also transplanting the plants into the room. I know what some of you are thinking right now. Why would I use a machine trimmer after putting so much work into growing those buds? Well, it comes down to time. You need to remember to trim a full room like this, it would take me a full week or two trimming by hand all day every day. That's time I don't have. When one of these machines are used in the correct environment with the proper dried flower, the trimmers do a fantastic job and are easy on the flower. Yes, nothing compares to a hand trim, but I do this in my spare time outside of my regular job making videos for YouTube, building a business and planning for the growth. So the trade off is more than worth it for now. Big shout outs to both Twister and the YouTube channel Growing Exposed for providing this trimmer. It came at the perfect time while building this room out.
Just for reference, there was more trichomes on my gloves from loading the machine than there was on the tumbler or blades of the trimmer after running the entire harvest through the machine. If you have your environment in the correct range, it allows the trichome heads to be not sticky while not being brittle enough to knock off during the tumbling process. I'm not saying you don't lose any heads, I'm just saying you don't lose as much as you would think. It took me just over one hour to trim 8.64 pounds of the harvest, which calculates out to 1.44 pounds per light. This number could drastically go up with supplemental CO2 along with fixing a few environmental conditions throughout the growth cycle. Everything we have learned from this cycle in the room will be improved upon for round two such as adding an AC system and the supplemental CO2 along with dialing in crop steering a little bit more. Thanks for making it to the end and watching the video. Don't forget to hit the like button if you enjoyed the video or found it at all helpful.